Hi, welcome to the Cosmic Pie Podcast. So I'm Wayne Barcos, and I'm with... Robert Moore. Nice to meet you. <laughs> so we're broadcasting live here from the campus of the University of North Dakota here in Grand Forks, North Dakota, where, Robert, it finally is spring. It is. I mean, wow, the temperature's where we can even go without a hoodie in the daytime. Yeah, so spring has sprung. Spring has sprung. The that, snow has melted. It's kind of nice here. Now we just got to wait for summer. Yeah, <laughs> I think we'll be waiting a little while. But we won't wish for winter, right? Once no. we get to summer, that's it. No more talk of the weather, okay? Uh, let's let's let winter lie for a little while. Exactly. So if you have any questions during the podcast, uh, please feel free to send us a live chat and we'll answer it as soon as we see it. And also just remember that whatever Robert and I say, that's our personal opinion, not necessarily the opinion of the university or the college or anyone else or anything affiliated with the University of North Dakota. Always got to make sure we say that, right, Robert? Well, I guess people would get the point by now, but at the same time, it's good to cover, you know, things and make sure that everybody does understand. Well, you never know what actually slips out when you're talking right, sometimes. Right, right. Right? We got to backpedal a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So today we are going to start by looking at some uh, recent observation taken by the James Webb Space Telescope. You know, ever since the telescope has started collecting images of the universe, Right, that's left us with a great resource of what to talk about on our weekly podcast. Oh, hasn't it, though? <laughs> so, I mean, has a week gone by that we haven't at least mentioned James Webb? Well, that's almost every podcast we mention. Right, right. right. So, yeah, so if you want to start with the first one, so this okay. is observations that were taken uh, of a nearby galaxy cluster, and it's and so that you can see the galaxy cluster in the foreground, but... When people, scientists study the individual galaxies, these are sort of grayish blobs, and some of them are color-coded with the red color, study the individual blobs of light that you see in this image. These individual blobs of light are all galaxies. And one of the things we're inter interested in is study the properties of these galaxies. And one of the things we want to look at is how far away they are. What is the distance of these objects? Now, one of the things we always have to remember, of course, is that we are always looking at a two-dimensional projection of three-dimensional space. Right. So when we see something in an image, that could be something in the foreground relative to all the other objects, or it could be objects in the background. I mean, you just don't know unless you know the distance. We have, don't have a perception of that third dimension, the distance. Absolutely. And uh, so that can cause a lot of problems because how do you know what's part of the cluster and what's not part of the cluster? Exactly. Now, the way that we use to estimate distances to galaxies that are imaged like this is to measure that, something that we call their redshift. Basically, it goes back to the 1920s um, when uh, Edwin Hubble published a paper on what has now become known as the hubble lemaitre laws, we want to be able to say, or the Hubble's Law, if you right. like, from historical times. And this basically means that the greater the distance is to a galaxy, the greater is its recessional velocity. And recessional velocity means speed away from us. Right. Now, we can measure the recessional velocity by looking at the spectrum of the light of an object. So, for example, we take the light of an object, we pass it through a prism or a spectrograph or a diffraction grating, and from that we can split, if you like, the wavelengths into a rainbow-like color, if you think of the optical part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, in detailed analysis or look at the spectrum of objects, like our own sun, for example, we notice a series of absorption lines. We've talked a little bit about this in previous mm -hmm. podcasts. And those lines basically are like fingerprints. So it's like doing CSI astronomy in a sense. <laughs> We yeah. can tell what the chemical composition is and physical conditions of the gas, which would be the outer atmosphere of our sun, by be detailed analysis of the spectrum of the sun. So, for example, that allows us to say with certainty that the sun contains iron and carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and hydrogen and helium and calcium and magnesium and all these things. And people wonder, how do you know the sun contains those elements? Did somebody physically go to the sun and taste it or something? I mean, what do you do? Right? And the answer is, is you don't have to. Yeah. Yeah, and the beauty of analyzing the spectrum is we do it remotely. Right. So this can be light coming from our sun in this example, or it can be light coming from a galaxy on the other side of the observable universe. 
And then from the detailed analysis of the spectrum, we can tell not only things like composition, but if those spectral lines are shifted, either to shorter wavelengths or longer wavelengths, that tells us information about the relative motion of that source of waves relative to us. So for example, if a galaxy is moving away from us, all of the spectral lines are shifted to longer wavelengths. And because in the optical, when you go to long wavelength, you're heading towards the red side of things, we call that a redshift. Right. And the opposite, of course, would be if an object just happened to be moving uh, towards us, relatively speaking, then all the lines are shifted to the blue side of the spectrum. That's towards the shorter wavelength, so we call that a blue shift. Mm -hmm. So the important discovery that was made in the early part of the 1900s was that when you look at uh, galaxies beyond our immediate surroundings, what we call beyond our local group, this would be galaxies that do not contain, the, other than the Andromeda galaxy, and some other, yeah, and some, and some low mass dwarf galaxies in yeah. our local group. Once you get outside our local neighborhood, every single galaxy is moving away from us. In fact, not only are, they, is, are those galaxies moving away from us, but the further away they are in terms of their distance, the faster they're moving away from us. Exactly. They have a greater redshift or recessional velocity. And the simplest interpretation of that and this was done first in the late 1920s, so nearly 100 years ago, is that the universe must be expanding. Right. So when we can, we can measure galaxies, distances, through various techniques, and it's much easier to measure them, of course, when they're nearby. Mm -hmm. And you can then use other things, and this would include exploding stars of a certain type, these are the carbon detonation supernovae. Certain types of variable stars. The Cepheid variable stars mm -hmm. and so on. And what we discovered is by measuring the distance independently of these galaxies and comparing it to their redshifts, that there is a nice correlation between those two. So that correlation, once you know, if you like, the connection going from recessional velocity to distance, then you can turn around and use this relationship and then, then look at galaxies that are much further away, and by just measuring their redshift and their spectrum, you can immediately plug that number into an equation right. and be able to calculate well, the distance. I'll, I'll point out another factor, you know, because people often ask me, well, how do, how do we know that that redshift is from the expansion of the universe? It could just be moving away. Well, the thing is, is each of these galaxies does indeed have its own little proper motion that could be towards us or away from us. But what happens is, is when you reach a certain point away from us, that expansion velocity overwhelms, covers up completely the individual proper motion of the, gal the galaxy. So it, it's, it's like, um, you know, you trying to swim against the current of the Mississippi River. You can go upstream or downstream, but the motion of the river overwhelms anything your little arms are going to do. And so it's the same type of idea. Yeah, and that, by the way, the redshift that's due to the expansion of the universe, we call that the cosmological redshift, right. just to make it distinct from any type of redshift due to what we call the peculiar motion of the galaxy. Peculiar motion, that's what it's called. Yeah, galaxies. for galaxies. Right. But, but with that argument, too, of course, if someone said, well, how do you know all these redshifts are not just due to peculiar motion? Well, then that begs the question, why are all these galaxies at this moment in time moving away from us? Right. That doesn't they're, seem they're normal. They're all moving away from us. Yeah. So how could that happen except they're being carried along? Right. And if you assume that the universe is expanding, let's say uniformly in all different directions, then it doesn't matter which galaxy you live in. If you looked around at all the other galaxies away from you, you would see they all displayed a redshift. Right. So everybody's moving away from everybody else. Now, by the way, a simple analogy of this, I always like to use this in my intro astronomy class, is imagine you had a rubber band. Mm -hmm. And you take two pins and stick them in this rubber band, let's say an inch apart from each other. Now, if you take your hands and grasp both ends of the rubber band and stretch it in two different directions, you'll notice the pins move away from each other because the rubber between the pins is stretching as you're pulling that rubber band and making it larger. Right. It's not like the pins are moving through the rubber itself and cutting little slits or something through the rubber. 
they're staying fixed in the positions that you put them. But because the rubber itself is expanding, those two pins are being carried along with that expansion. Uh, another analog that I've, I've, I've used and heard of is expanding raisin bread. And you've got raisins stuck in the dough, but as the bread rises, they're getting farther and further apart. Well, they're not tadpoles wiggling through the dough. They're just being carried around along by that expansion of the dough. That's right. And then the classic kind of example on that, and you uh, remind me of it, is the one with the balloon. The balloon. I so, don't like that no, one. No, and, and that's what I was <laughs> going to mention, right? The balloon one is where you put, you know, dots or coins or tape something to the surface of the balloon and blow it up. They move away from each other. But that you have to realize that you're looking at something that's two-dimensional in, in terms of the surface, that those coins or dots, or if they're observers, let's say, in those pretend galaxies, they can't look in the interior of the balloon or away from the surface of the balloon. So that analogy has its limitations well, like every analogy. Right. Well, not only that, but it has a center. Yes, that that's right. There's a point at which they're all expanding away from, and that is not the universe. Right. <laughs> well, people ask, where's the center of the expansion, right? The universe right. is expanding. Where's the center? We're all part of the center, center in the sense that if you go back in time to the beginning of the universe, let's say the Big Bang event, then... We are all at the center, unless, of course, it was an infinite. It's a and, infinite universe, and and that leads to one of the other conceptual problems. Is, is because we call it the Big Bang, they think of it as people tend to think of it as an explosion, and it's not an explosion. It's the universe itself came into being, and starts expanding, starts stretching. Right, and you know the worst thing about that too is when you watch documentaries on TV. And I won't mention their names because I might get sued or something like that. What they show is like big banks. You see a little dot in the middle of your screen. All of a sudden, boom, everything is expanding outwards. Right. And you, you ask the question, well, who's, who's like taking that uh, film, right? Right. Somebody would have to be outside the universe to see that. But it, space and time only exist inside the universe to our knowledge. So that if you were outside, the universe is a point. Well, unless it's infinite you know, in extent. Unless but it's e infinite in extent. But, but either way, right. there's no there's no place where you could stand or be to see this sort of right. thing happening. So it's really a bad representation it and is. adds more to confusion than clarification. Than clarification, yes. But so, so the redshifts then can okay. tell us then uh, about the distance. So the interesting thing about this image is we see this galaxy cluster in the foreground. Like I said, that's what caught people's attention. They wanted to study the properties of the galaxies in the cluster and so on. But the squares that you can see there that are in this image and the ones that are shown in this particular image that I have here are five of them. And when people studied the galaxy, so these squares are just made around individual galaxies. When you looked at the redshifts, we find these redshifts are at a much higher value. Therefore, that means the distance is much greater than the cluster that you see here that's in the foreground. And because these galaxies are relatively close together, and by the way, the redshifts are at this value of 7.9, but I, I could tell you 203, what's that even mean? What that means is the light that left those galaxies and just reaching us today left those galaxies when the universe was only 650 million years old. Right. So that's on the order of just over uh, what, roughly 13.2 billion years ago. So what we think these galaxies represent is that they're just starting to come together under their mutual gravitational attraction uh, to form eventually a cluster. Right. So what and we're that's cool. <laughs> so what we're seeing here then is looking at something that is before it becomes a cluster, and we call that a proto cluster. Okay. So you're seeing essentially the birth of a galaxy cluster. Now, why is that important? Well, we want to understand galaxy clusters. There's lots of them in our universe. We know there's, it's a busy avenue. There's lots of evolution or changes that happen to galaxies yep. when they're in this type of environment. We want to be able to study it from the moment they start to form to fully appreciate everything that happens to it over its lifetime. Now, the thing in astronomy is such that, it, let's say you want to study the whole cycle of a star. So you look at some star that's just forming today that you can see with your telescope, let's say, hidden inside the Orion Nebula. Mm -hmm. And with the right instrumentation, you can just pick it out today, you, let's say, in infrared. Still surrounded by its nice cloud of dust and gas. Right. It's in the cocoon still. Yeah. Okay? I like those stars. Now, let's say <laughs> a lot of stuff is going to happen in the next, let's say, 50 million years. 
for that star to finally become a real star, as we say, to begin the burning or the fusion of hydrogen to helium in its core. So we want to know all the detailed intermediate steps that occur from starting inside the cocoon to making it to what we call the main sequence in the HR diagram. So Robert, I don't know about you, but do you have 50 million years you can spare so you can kind of stand by and maybe take an image every clear night there is from Earth and then watch how it changes over that 50 million years to be able to tell me at the end of it all what actually happened well, to that Well, I object. do because I intend to live forever. Oh, okay. But the rest of y'all don't. But you know what we do have? What do we have, Robert? Roughly 100 billion stars in our galaxy that are in various stages of their age. That's right. So we can study a large population. I was going to say after 50 million years, you'd have to rewrite the textbooks. But you may know that in 50 million years from now, there may not be any textbooks. textbooks. Right. So, but yeah, that's the point. You, don't, you can't look at one specific isolated object and think you're going to study it. It's like trying to understand, let's say, the evolution of trees. And the only time you have is a weekend in June. I'm so you wander to a forest somewhere, let's say, in northern Minnesota, and you, you look around with, you know, what you, where you are and where you're located. You map out, you measure things, you measure the height of trees, you, you know, all this kind of stuff, and you do that over the weekend. And then if you're lucky, you're in an area where you see little seedlings are starting to grow. You see trees that maybe are a foot high. You see some more mature uh, trees that are around that are, you know, a 10 feet high or 20 feet high, all of these things. And then some trees that are laying on the bottom of the forest floor, rotting away because they fell down, uh, let's say, after being alive for 70 years or so, and they're right. decaying away. So you can piece together by just observing around you in a large enough population of trees, you can piece together the whole of how a tree starts from I, a seedling to its final demise. I like your analogy because much as with trees, coming up from a family that did a lot of forestry work and where I'm from, um, it also works because if you only look at one little area of trees, well, you're going to see most of them are actually about the same age, which is the same thing we find with stars. If you only look at a certain group, a certain small area, generally speaking, those stars are grouped together and they're going to be about the same age. And uh, you've got to look around here and go over here to Yosemite and go down here to the Gulf Coast states, and you got to look around to get a real good view of the various age stages. Right, and that comes from the fact when you're uh, talking about stars that uh, an individual star spends 90% of its total lifetime as a main sequence star. Right. And so if you look at a small sample of stars, you got 90% chance they're all main sequence stars. <laughs> then there's right? that. Yeah. And so you may only be looking at main sequence stars. You're not looking at stars that are in the early, just starting to form, or looking at stars that have evolved beyond the main sequence. So you have to look at a large enough population for sure. See our show on the HR diagram of the main sequence and cut off when we were talking about the cut off of the main sequence. Yeah. Where it branched away. I mean, if you want another analogy, it's the, it's the condition where, let's say, an alien, a UFO comes to the Earth full of aliens, okay? Mm -hmm. They're, they're on their way to somewhere else. They stop by for, you know, just to have a snack, right? To fill up type of thing, right? Right. Have a rest. They only have an hour of our Earth time to, for them to look at the planet, right? And they want to understand about life, let's say, Homo sapiens. So where would you go? Would you go in the middle of nowhere where the chance of finding one individual is pretty low? No. <laughs> no. Where you go is to large city. Mm -hmm. And let's say they decided to look on New look at New York. Everybody picks on New York, so let's do that. Okay? So let's pick on New York. <laughs> so so the aliens then are you have an afternoon to look at New York City to study humans. Mm -hmm. Where do you look? Well, if you look in the nurseries and the hospitals in New York City, right now, today, as you're listening to this podcast. There are babies being born in New York City because it's just so many people live there, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Childbirth is occurring every single probably minute, right, of the right. hour, okay? Right. So the aliens could easily focus in on and see how humans are born. At the same time, you have young children playing outside at lunchtime in a local elementary school. You can see, you know, what humans do when they're young like that in that part of their lives. And you can continue that sort of extension, you know, high school to college, university. To then an office can, building. To yeah, do you look at the Wall Street and see yeah. what you're like when you're in your mid-career sort of thing, right, working mm -hmm. in that area, all the way up until eventually you'll see these places in the city where you have these long line of cars moving fairly slow, and they're heading to graveyards. And so you catch a funeral that's, right. on, on, that's, go, you know, that's undergoing 
the, the, um, the event. And so you can see what happens to humans when they die. What is the sort of process that we go through to bury individuals? Right. So you can study that. In other words, you can study the whole human population in terms of their different stages by looking at a large sample of humans at once. Right. Now, that's the kind of thing we like to do. So if you look at galaxy clusters, individually you'll catch them at various stages in their lives. But the, the interesting thing on the image that we've shown, if you want to go I'll, back I'll to go that, back Robert, to is that for, this, for the first time, not really for the first time, but at least this is the best view we've had, and we'll continue to do so, of some you know, newly forming galaxy clusters, that these galaxy clusters are forming at a really high redshift, which means a long distance away, which means really back to an early part of the history of our universe. And we're catching, if you like, the galaxy cluster nurseries and what's happening inside of them. Right. Now, we've had hint of this before with the Hubble Space Telescope and so on and other telescopes. But the James Webb Space Telescope has actually made it sort of a prime instrument that's fine-tuned to look at things that are really far away. It's red sensitive. That is, it's tuned to be optimal in the infrared. Right. And that's exactly what you need to study these proto-clusters. Absolutely. So this is going to be one of many that will be studied given the total lifetime of the James Webb Space Telescope itself. Cool. Yeah. And, and this is one of the cool things about James Webb. This is one of its design parameters, what it was made to look for. So we're, we're going to see a lot of changes to our views of galaxy formation and cluster formation, just as we've already seen in the past decade or three uh, with the finding of the first exoplanets we've had to change our views of how planets form. So now we're where we can see the forming of galaxies, we're going to change our ideas about how galaxies form. Yeah, and we've seen evidence for that already with the discovery of very high redshift galaxies that are fully formed. Right. Which is a little bit unexpected, but we really didn't know precisely the timescales involved and in how a galaxy forms. So on the one hand, we were a bit surprised, but on the other hand, maybe it wasn't really that much of a surprise because right. we really didn't have a clear understanding of all the nitty-gritty details. That, that's why I like bringing up the correlation. Most people have familiarity with a planet where we're standing on one, or sitting in our case. And, uh, um, you know, it was a surprise to find that the disks of debris and gas and dust that planets form from around stars went away within like 100, 150 million years. We thought we had billions of years to form planets. No, you've got to form them quick, relatively speaking. So, okay, so the same thing with galaxies. What we're basically finding out now is, is we thought we had all this time to form them, and suddenly, no, it happened quickly. So, Yeah, and so we're speaking about galaxy evolution, Mm -hmm. So, Robert, did you want to bring up the next oh, slide? Sure. Uh, this one? So, did you have it in there? Oh, slide I three? Not. No, okay. Well, don't worry about it. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, I didn't it, bring up sl the, a slide. I can make a. No, make it. well, we can show that. Do you have it? Yeah, maybe? I do have okay. it. Okay. Yeah, so maybe you can prepare and I can continue talking. So, we're talking about galaxy evolution and we're talking about proto clusters. And it's interesting to know that when. their shape and morphology, as we uh, say. That is the high-density cluster environment. And have an effect on what we see. And, and just a second, folks. I think you're seeing a blank screen. I will have the image on here that he tried in just a second. And now I'll blow it up because I think it's... I think y'all are seeing me as I'm manipulating this. Uh, so there we go. Okay. Yeah, so, so this is an example of a galaxy that's in a galaxy cluster. So the galaxy itself has a catalog name, which really doesn't mean anything. It's, right, it's, it's J0204. And it's in the galaxy cluster called Abel 957. Now, what you'll notice is the galaxy is in the center. It's a spiral galaxy, as you can tell. It's a disk galaxy. But notice that uh, in the bottom part of the galaxy, so the galaxy runs horizontally in the center, but streaming downwards are these sort of long strips of blue and red sort of spots or regions in those strips. And what you're seeing is that gas 
that's in that spiral galaxy is being forced downwards in this orientation that we have here due to something that we call ram pressure stripping. Oh, yeah, that stuff, yeah. So this is an example of what can happen to a galaxy in a galaxy cluster in terms of how it can change, is that the physical makeup of the galaxy can be altered. In this case, what's happening is the galaxy is moving through hot gas. That hot gas is confined in the galaxy cluster itself. Now, when you think of something hot, like a hot gas, you think of expansion. Right. Right? So a hot gas would expand. So imagine that you had a, a ball of gas, or let's say a container, and inside the container is hot gas. You open that container, out comes that hot gas and starts to expand in all different directions. Mm -hmm. Okay. But in this type of environment in a galaxy cluster, the combined mass of everything holds on to that hot gas so it can't expand beyond the galaxy cluster. It's confined to the cluster itself. But the galaxies can be moving through it. But the galaxies that fall from the outside in towards the cluster, they're drawn there because of gravity of the combined mass of the cluster, which by the way is all of the ordinary matter that's in the cluster and also our favorite matter. <laughs> Dark matter. Dark matter. <laughs> okay, so the combination of all that matter attracts things from the outskirts, from outside of the cluster itself. And that includes other galaxies that are nearby. So as galaxies fall into the cluster, they fall into this hot gas. And that it's hot gas out. then creates a pressure against you as you're falling towards the center of the cluster. And if you have stuff within the cluster that's not held on too strongly to the cluster itself by gravity, you can lose that gas. It gets stripped away. It's like, for example, if you're driving in your car and you wind down the window and you put out your hand, and in your hand are a couple pieces of sh uh, uh, shredded paper, confetti, mm -hmm. let's say. And you try to hold on to all the confetti that you have, but the wind, the force of the wind is so strong from the pressure, it opens your hand a bit and you see confetti flying out of your hand backwards behind the car. It's the same effect in some sense. It's just the hot gas that's less able to stay within the host cluster itself that's being stripped out. Now, the interesting thing in this image, and by the way, this is a Hubble Space Telescope image of this okay. galaxy, is that in these strips of gas that are coming from this galaxy, we see signs of active star formation. formation. I and thought that, that's what the blue color would be. And that's exactly. The blue color and the red colors are a sign of star formation. So the blue color are these reflection nebulae. Mm -hmm. Okay, So these are star-forming regions. Oh. So there are little high-density knots or clumps, however you want to describe it, within the gas that's being trailed behind the galaxy as it moves towards the center of the cluster. And those, hot, those clumps of material then are squeezed together gravity ultimately collapses them down to form stars, new stars. The red objects are the emission nebulae, and that's a sign of the formation of the really massive stars, which we call the O and B type stars. Mm -hmm. And these stars produce a tremendous amount of ultraviolet photons because their surface temperatures are anywhere from you know, roughly 35,000 to 50,000 degrees. And under that extreme temperature, a lot of these high energy ultraviolet photons, they run into surrounding hydrogen gas and they strip away the electrons. It's called ionization. Well, that doesn't just stop there. What happens is the electrons look around and try to recombine with protons. protons. And in the process of doing so, there is the emission of this red light. It's one of the spectral lines is known as H alpha line. Right. Okay. And so this, is, this signifies then these blue and red regions, sites of star formation. So we can see the gas being stripped out of this galaxy and causing triggered star formation within those tendrils, if you like, of that stripped <laughs> so gas. that's presence of stars that are actually outside of a galaxy now. Yeah, and that also tells you which way the galaxy is falling in, right? So right. clearly the confetti flies behind you as you move forward. It doesn't fly in front of you. And that gives you some idea of motion, right? You can just see confetti flying. You can tell which way the car is moving, if that's all you see. Right. And same as this case. You can look at the tendrils here of that star-forming <laughs> gas to get an idea of which way that galaxy is moving. So it would be moving to the upper part, in general, of this image mm -hmm. that you see here. 
So I thought this was a pretty it's cool a image. In fact, image. over time, what can happen is the star-forming gas can essentially all be stripped out of this disk galaxy. And, and it turns into something that looks very much like an S0, zero. type of galaxy. Well, lenticular, wouldn't it? Yeah, lenticular S0, same category, yeah. same name. Now, so, i got to ask a question about this because I'm looking at the picture and I notice something. There's another galaxy there mm -hmm. to the left. Is this also a collision that's occurring? Only if we know the redshift of the two galaxies because okay. we got to worry about projection effects. Right. Okay. I was just wondering now, if there was any evidence. Right. From the, the, from the shape of it, you can see the galaxy. And this is the, the blob we're looking at that's on the left side of the disk-like structure. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it looks distorted. Right. And that would tell you it's interacting with something. So without knowing the redshifts, and I don't know the redshifts, right, of that other blob, I would say there's a good chance it's part of the cluster and it's interacting also with this galaxy because right. of the distortion you see in the tidal tail, especially the one that goes sort of roughly upwards, the upwards right. direction. And, and that's why I was asking is if you knew enough about this particular region of the cluster, the other you could tell me if those two were interacting because it does look that way. That's right. So without yeah. knowing the redshift, I don't know for sure, but you'd have to know the redshift of it, then right. you'd be able to say. Okay. But the other thing to note is, if you look within the tendrils of that gas being stripped out, you can see other galaxies that go, have more of a yellowish or brownish type color, and they are galaxies that's way, way in the background. Mm -hmm. Okay, They're not part of this cluster. And you can get that just by looking at the color. Right. So the color, this is an optical image, by the way, that color just means that light has been redshifted. That's why it looks red. Right. So if it's at a greater redshift, that means it's at a larger distance away from us than the galaxies that you see with the tendrils coming off that's mm -hmm. in this cluster in the foreground. Now, that would not be... Uh, uh, that would, those three galaxies, I would not care to figure out the Z number of for myself because you would also have that dust that's streaming out of that foreground galaxy that would be absorbing light and making it red too. Well, the thing you'll notice is that all three galaxies have almost, almost the same reddish type color. Right. So there's no way it would be a uniform blanket of dust like that, right? right. It would be stripped out like the gas. It I, should be in tendrils, right? I agree, but to get yeah. an accurate Z number, you would have to... Well, you just need the redshift, right? It doesn't right. matter the dust. Uh, you wouldn't. Okay. So you wouldn't rely on the color. So you just go and look at the spectrum. Oh, right, right. Of these individual that would galaxies, be affected by the dust. and that's, that's right. not affected by the yeah. dust in a sense. It would change the shifting of the spectral line. Right, right. So, I lost yeah. my mind there for a second. Yeah. I'm sorry. But if you just relied on the color, then that could be the case because right. objects can look red because there's more dust that lies between us and that object. In yeah. fact, we know every star essentially, other than the sun, every star in the sky has a, a little bit amount of reddening. Mm -hmm. because of the distribution of dust within our Milky Way right. mainly. And if you want a an experience that you probably had with it. I think we showed a picture of this, but if you've ever been where there's a forest fire in the area, the sunsets are always nice and bright red because of the soot, the dust that's in the air is, you know, making things look nice and red. Right, and you don't have to go far to find dust. It's sprinkled all in our solar system. That's the zodiacal light that you mm -hmm. can see, especially at certain times of the year, like in the fall and so on. Right. And that's reflected sunlight off of dust that comes back and on the night side of the Earth. But speaking about dust, you know, do you, you know one place in the solar system that we know has a lot of dust? Mars. Yeah. Mars. So what's going on with Mars nowadays? Okay. So, so, so this is a very interesting image taken recently from Mars. And what you see in this image is actually taken about 40 feet above the surface of Mars by the helicopter. This is Ingenuity. Mm -hmm. that's on Mars now that's working, and along with it we have the rover Perseverance. So the uh, arrow that you see sort of on the bottom right, the blue arrow that's pointing towards the right, that's actually the shadow of the helicopter on Mars. Mm -hmm. And so it's in flight now. If you look carefully on either side of the image, you can make out part of the wheel-like structure. Oh, yeah, there it is. Okay? Yeah. Now, if you look at the upper left where the green arrow is pointing, that's actually the rover that's on Mars, Perseverance. Yeah. And if you look really carefully in this image, if you kind of go horizontally towards the right, starting with the rover, and you go almost all the way over across, you can actually see the tracks on the surface that the rover made. Are you able to see that? I'm not able to see that, but I... We're... Oh, okay. He just pointed it out to me. 
I would have never guessed that was the the rover tracks. Yeah, but. you can see two parallel like uh, scuffling of the so of soil from the two Absolutely. wheels on either side. Well, it was actually yeah. more than two, but yeah, it's kind of cool that you can see that. And so what the Ingenuity is doing, it's making you know it was only designed to, to make a few flights. It was just a, right. it's just an engineering test. And this thing has made over fifty flights now, believe it or not. And so it's been widely spectacular in terms yeah. of its results. So they're going to, NASA, you know what's going to happen. They're going to send helicopters to, you know, again to Mars and on to other bodies as well, you know, that, right. that have a, at least a thick enough atmosphere that you can design a helicopter and, to work here. And that was one thing because I see, a, I, I read comments, so I, I see a lot of comments that are like, how can a helicopter fly on Mars? And it's like, it's not a vacuum, folks. I mean, That's right. It's a stronger vacuum than is at the heart of your vacuum cleaner, but there is some atmosphere on Mars, and the rotors on this thing are traveling, spinning, and there's two sets of rotors uh, at a rate that is like just, holy cow, it's like your, your 7200 RPM. Uh, yeah, I forget the actual number, but it's but thousands it's and thousands of ten, RPM. Yeah, I think it's, it's 10,000 Yeah, or it's more. way faster than a typical helicopter on the Earth. Right. And it, it has to be because it's, you know, the atmosphere of Mars is rarefied, but it's not zero. Yeah, and then you can also think, you know, if you know a little bit about Mars, you know in the past there's been evidence and lots of images taken of dust devils on Mars. How do you get a dust devil on Mars if there's no atmosphere, if right. it's a vacuum? Right. You can't. You can't. Why would you have windblown features on Mars if there's no atmosphere, if it was always a vacuum? You can't. So the evidence, and we can me we measure that, of course. We've landed the Viking landers back in the 70s, and that tasted the atmosphere. So we had a good measurement of the composition of the gases that we find in the atmosphere on Mars and so on. And so we know in detail, and we've had other instruments yeah. uh, since that time, of course, and we know in detail what the atmosphere is all about. Right. And that's why we were able to design this vehicle, this helicopter, essentially, to be able to think of it as a drone, if you like, to be able to operate on the surface of Mars itself. It's just a matter of uh, uh, yeah. advancements enough to get it light enough that you can actually send it on a small enough rocket so you don't have to sell the farm to pay for everything. Right. You see? Now, now, I will make note, that's, that's a really good point. They actually did not know for certain that it would fly. This was a test project. It could have failed spectacularly and just sat there going, ee! Well, yes. don't forget, we also yeah. test things in our vacuum, vacuum chambers. chambers. So we have very large, NASA's access to very large vacuum changer, change, chambers that we put in spacecraft, like the Apollo spacecraft and so on. And so all you got to do is just add a little bit of atmosphere to simulate the Martian environment. And that was tested a lot here on Earth before they right. sent it up. So we knew it would work. The thing is, it wasn't designed to last a long period of time because they thought they could do a few, you know, a few runs. And don't forget, the light travel time to Mars on the order of 10 to 15 minutes. minutes or so, depending yeah. on the distance, which changes, right. you know, because Mars and Earth are not always in the same position in its orbit all the time, right? They're constantly orbiting the sun, so the distance can vary greatly from the Earth to Mars. And so you can't rely on signaling your helicopter, oh, you better start landing or, or uh, you know, whatever, right, <laughs> to control it because it's not going to work. The time mm -hmm. delay is too great. So all of it has to be controlled on board the helicopter with sophisticated right. computer software so it knows when to land and how to land softly and all the different things and what it needs to do to take off from the surface and so on and not to crash on it too hard. All of that was the major test that was done right. from the engineering point of view. And so far, you know, luckily it all works. It works. You know, so so, so so what they're using a the helicopter, just to kind of finish up the story, so what they're using a the helicopter for now is really a lot of it has to do with recon. Mm -hmm. So they do reconnaissance of the local area, so that helps better know where to send the rover. Where's an interesting feature? Where's yeah, interesting where's the danger location? areas where you where's don't want to, if you go up too large of a grade on the side of a hill, for example, maybe the rover will flip backwards, and once it flips, that's it. It's over with, right? Right. So you want to be very careful, and these things cost a lot of money, of course. And so you want to be very careful in what you what you actually where you actually send the rover when it's on the surface of Mars. And the helicopter ha helps us looking for uh, bad spots on the landscapes, you know, danger areas, if you like, right. and and you know, mapping out where it needs to go next. All right. So this is a very valuable asset. In fact, I wouldn't doubt that for now on, with every rover we send to Mars is going to have some this, kind of air air reconnaissance. That's right. 
Yeah. Right. That's a sort of seems because, that way. Because another project I've, I've heard mentioned, at least, is to use a balloon, essentially, to, to float up, have motors on it that push against the atmosphere, but the lift is generated by a, a balloon with, like, hydrogen or helium in it. Well, they're already planning the Dragonfly mission to go to Titan. Right. Right, to fly around in that atmosphere. So yeah. that's going to be very, I mean, the, the, the expansion of drones on the Earth has really, you know, entered into the space age. It's, for for once, the proliferation in the popular culture has preceded its proliferation into the the scientific culture. Yeah. So yeah, a lot of drones and and so forth are being planned right now. Yeah. So that will just continue in the future. Yeah, it's great stuff, and uh, you know, uh, another fac facet of Mars lately. It's come out that people are starting to talk about, uh, due to the seismometer on Mars, um, it's the size and features of its core. And so I thought it would be interesting to start talking a little bit about how does seismology tell us anything? And first off, I think, is a good place to start is just to look at the different types of seismic waves. So I don't know how much you know about this, but uh, Wayne, but... Uh, uh, there are three different, primarily three different types of seismic waves. Uh, the first type is surface waves. Well, we're not really interested in that because we're talking about the interior and surface waves. Well, what do you know? They travel along the surface. So they're not going to go very deep. Now, from a structural point, these are the ones you're worried about in an earthquake because the surface waves are what make the ground move. All right, so this is the case where you can put your buildings on if you like some material let's i'll just make an example though it's probably not this rubber so mm -hmm. when the building shakes us back and forth along the surface parallel to the surface this rubble will prevent that building from collapsing it's absorbing that energy in that mm -hmm. sense right and dissipating in the form of heat the rubber would heat up of course through the motion right, right. so they're nice to keep in mind, but these surface waves basically are not what we're talking about when we're, we start talking about seismic waves and telling us about the interior of a planet or an object. What we're mainly looking at is these primary and secondary waves, which secondary waves look very similar to that first type of surface wave up there, but they're different in that they're transverse waves that are propagating completely through the su substrate instead of diminishing as you go down into it. And the P waves, the primary waves, are compression waves. The, to the right of this big, big, big uh, picture shows a nice set of compression waves moving through a spring. So you've got er areas where the spring is stretched out and the areas where it's compact compressed. Whereas the S waves have a vertical motion, they oscillate perpendicular to the motion way the wave is traveling. So they go up and down. It's like shaking a jump rope. All right, so that's the types of seismic waves. And what type of snake is that? Is that a coral snake? Oh, uh, I don't see any yellow bands, so it's probably not a coral snake. What's the snake with the white bands, do you know? Uh, yes, or is uh, that just scarlet king snake. Okay, there you go. So, yeah. I, You're a snake snakeologist. I, I have kept my share <laughs> of snakes, including a Sonoran milk snake, which looks very similar to that. Um, it, it still has the yellow, but it doesn't have the contact, you know, uh, there's an old saying about a coral snake, uh, red touches yellow, he's a dangerous fellow, red touches, red touches black, he's okay, Jack. There you go. So, come I here do for know a... some about snakes, yes. Yeah, this podcast can tell you <laughs> lots of facts about nature. That's it. And that was kind of the point, I think. Mm -hmm. And we, we just focused mainly on astronomy, but we do have plans of trying to branch out a little bit. So uh, keep that in mind as you tune in. So these are the main types of seismic waves. And the usual answer I get from that is, is okay, so what? But there's some interesting properties, especially about those secondary or S waves and primary or P waves. And that is that they can only travel, or they travel differently through different types of media. S waves, for instance, cannot travel through liquids, period. End of statement. They cannot do it. So if you have a shadow for these seismic waves where the S waves disappear, which is what we have happen here on Earth, 
Um, we measure earthquakes and we time the waves when they, when, uh, when they reach the, the, the seismic stations and things like that. And what we find is, is that given the location of an earthquake, we find this nice shadow which tells us the size of the liquid core. All right? And it's just like the picture on the left. So from that, and how large the shadow region is, uh, we can tell the size of the liquid core. Okay, Robert. Yeah. How many planets in our solar system have a liquid core surrounding a solid? Uh, to our knowledge right now, that we know for sure, it's only the three planets that are three objects that we've planted seismometers on. That have a liquid part of a core yep. that's liquid. All three of them that we've planted seismometers on show signs of a liquid core. So what's the three objects then? Earth, mm -hmm. the moon, mm -hmm. and Mars. So why is it that the Earth then has a strong magnetic field when the moon and Mars doesn't? And go win your Nobel Prize. The answer is, is we don't know. Because it would be easy just to assume they don't have a liquid. Part of the core is not liquid. Right. But we, we honestly don't know uh, really well. We know that it has to be being generated by circulation currents in the liquid. Uh, you start circulating a, a metallic liquid, you will generate a magnetic field. So you could say a liquid part of the core being liquefied is a necessary but not sufficient condition to generate a magnetic field. Absolutely. And, and I like the way you pr pronounce that. It is a necessary but not sufficient condition. Because we have reasons to believe that Mercury's core is partly liquid. Mercury does have a magnetic field, but it's got a weird magnetic field. It's actually offset. It's not centered in the planet. But that's for another show. <laughs> okay. So the other way we know, so then the question becomes, well, how do we know that part of the core is solid if these S waves are blocked? And that's the right-hand part of this figure, the P waves. The P waves can propagate through a liquid just fine. They don't care that it's a liquid, but it does alter how they're bent. And then if they encounter a solid, they're bent a different way entirely. And so from looking at these reception times and the fact that these P waves will still create a shadow zone where they're not found due to the fact of the bending, we can now say, oh, hey, there's a solid portion to the core as well, and it has to be this size. So the idea is then you create seismic waves. Mm -hmm. So let's say you bury so many tons of TNT under the ground, right? You know the location. Or a nuclear bomb. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Underground it's, nuclear tests were right. So godsend. In right. <laughs> so you know the exact location of the source of the seismic waves, that red dot on the top. Mm -hmm. And you know exactly when the explosion occurred, you can time it. Right. And then you have uh, detectors located various, various positions around the Earth. And they also are timed. Let's say they're all running on atomic clocks or mm -hmm. synchronized to some, some way with the GPS system or whatever. You know their exact position as well. And it's just a matter of saying, okay, which one gets hit at what time? That's exactly it. And then you can figure this out. And then we can take the time it took even where both P and S waves arrive. Because they travel at different speeds, P and S waves, you can also time the difference between when each type arrives. Then, as well as bending, these waves are also reflected. So you can get information about the interfaces, the places where things change, based on when reflections start to rise. Arrive. So now when the S and the P waves hit a seismometer, how do you know which one is an S wave signal and which one is a P wave signal? Oh, very nice. Because of the way they move the ground. Because of the way they move. Because S waves, if you remember, are these transverse waves, mm -hmm. these oscillations like a jump rope being waved by a, a kid, and the P waves are compression. So they actually show up as a different waveform on the seismometer. Okay, and now in the old days, you think of just a needle going up and but down on a trace paper or we're something. We're not doing that anymore. Yeah. We're, we've actually got what's called geophones that are doing the job, and they, are, they can differentiate between being rocked back and forth and being squeezed. 
Okay, so you can, yeah, okay. So it's almost like knowing the uh, polarization angle in some sense. And that's how we can tell, actually, glad you brought that up. Because, yes, that's actually what it is, but that's also how we tell the difference between a reflected ray wave and a transmitted but bent wave. A refracted wave in that right. sense, right? And, and we can tell that because the phase angle, as it's called, changes when you reflect something, but it doesn't when you refract it. Right. Okay. So, you know, this, this I'm trying to simplify what is, quite honestly, a very, 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 very complicated picture. But, you know, this is like, reading these seismic waves is really like being able to put your finger down into the core. And then when you combine that with various experiments where we squeeze and heat up materials in various types of hydraulic or non-hydraulic presses, and we can tell the speed that these waves should travel at depending on the material, and we can tell how they interact with the material that should be down there that deep. And what we find is this works just like what the experiments in the lab tell us it should. Kind of like spectroscopy. Right. <laughs> now, what was the motivation then for talking about this today? Did you have anything particular you wanted to um, mention? Mainly, I had seen that people were starting to talk about uh, this. There's, with this rover Perseverance. Yes. Uh, along, along with the helicopter came an actual seismometer that we emplaced correctly. The Viking landers actually had seismometers on it, but they were attached to the underside of the lander, which means wind coming along would vibrate it and make it think it was an earthquake. This one was actually removed from the lander, put out some distance away from it, <laughs> and was able to take measurements. And so with multiple earthquakes now sensed on Mars, uh, it's now able to, we're actually now able to start saying the core is this size, which it's larger than we had hypothesized. And uh, what about the makeup of that core? You mentioned it already, okay. though. It is liquid, and I'm not going to go into full detail on why, but we think it's got a high concentration of sulfur in it because it is liquid. Uh, the bottom line is much as adding. Something we in North Dakota know a lot about. You add salt to ice, and it turns back into a liquid due to the depression of the freezing point. It makes the freezing point go down, right? Well, when you add stuff to iron, to metal, it will actually lower the point at which it converts from liquid to solid. So the fact that Mars, which is much smaller than Earth, still has a liquid core, says there has to be something because we can sit there and work out how convection and conduction re remove heat from the core. Right. Okay. We, we understand that physics very well. And it says that Mars, if it has a liquid core, it should be very tiny. Now, it's large. Now, I know that recently, remember the InSight mission to Mars? Mm -hmm. That was, they, at, at first when it was launched, I remember NASA was claiming, at least in some of their press releases, this was the first seismometer to go to Mars, which wasn't true. Yeah, it's InSight, not Perseverance. InSight, yeah. Yeah. Because that's the one that had that probe that was going to dig its way like a, a mole, remember? And it got, <laughs> right. it couldn't go down very far, so the experiment was kind of a failure. Uh, because uh -huh. they assumed there was going to be a certain amount of friction between the instrument itself and the soil, and right. the friction is, was a lot less. The where they had to whack it yeah, that's right. They were banging on, trying to <laughs> bang it into the ground. But it had to go down quite far, like several, several feet yeah. underground before it could make useful measurements. But the seismometer on the InSight mission, uh, even though it wasn't the first time, but it, like this was the first good one. Good one. And I remember that spike now, what it was going to measure and did get us some measurement of, but not the quality or the level we wanted, was the temperature, the heat radiating out from inside the planet. Right. The temperature gradient as you go down. Well, the reason it didn't work as well as we'd hoped is because the top layers of the ground are heated by the sun as well as the interior of the planet. Mm -hmm. So you've got to get it down below that zone if you want to get the heat coming out from inside the planet. Yeah, and it's not like there's water on the surface so that the soil is moist and therefore it would stick almost like clay in some sense, right. right? So there was the friction that would allow that probe to go down just didn't exist in what they thought. 
Right. But we're learning. I mean, you don't know these things until you do the experiment, right? right. You can play in sandboxes on Earth, which we do. Which we do. There are sandboxes <laughs> at JPL, for example, right, mm -hmm. where these things are all set up. That they, but they don't have the soil exactly the same characteristics as what you'd find on real Mars. Right. That's where the problem comes in. We can simulate, but the right. simulation wasn't perfect. Right. And, and we can make assumptions based on these types of measurements we have from Earth. Uh, like we know that the heat radiating up from the center of Earth is roughly 90 watts per square meter. So a box about as far as I can spread my arms, do that square on the ground, and there's about 90 watts, so less than a 100 watt light bulb puts out heat-wise, uh, coming up from inside the Earth through the surface. Now I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. Okay. And we've talked about this before, but why is it then that the Earth is the only object in the solar system that has a magnetic field like that and it has a part of a, its core is liquid where mars okay. for example and the moon what's your best uh insight of that no need okay. to use that term again the, the current working hypotheses for lack of better terms because we don't know um is that there's a chemical gradation a chemical uh, effect where lighter elements are being expelled from the solidifying inner core and they're floating up through the liquid outer core and that's producing currents so we can name that I'll, so uh yeah. composition uh yeah. differentiation that's it yes is that I the term could, though i could not think of the term yes that's that it. is the term yeah. oh there you go i know it'd be differentiation Chem chemical but... compositional differentiation yes. there you go yeah and, and so that's the mechanism we think people think it's uh this is actually where my research work brushed up against. People think it's because there's radioactive elements in the core. The problem with that is, is most of the long-lived radioisotopes like uranium, thorium, and potassium do not like being in iron. They really do not like being in iron. They will dissolve into rock more than they'll dissolve into iron. And as such, it can't be radi uh, nuclear, uh, radi nuclear heating that's producing a thermal gradient through it. So the, the current working idea is, is that it must be some kind of chemical gradient. So does that mean that it's the Earth being the most massive of those three objects that has something to, to do with this, do you wonder? I, I hesitate to speak on that because I haven't looked into it. I mean, um, if you look at something that's very similar to the Earth in terms of its mass, Venus would be the planet. And Venus has no discernible magnetic field. Right, and but does Venus have a liquid core? That's an upcoming mission, trying to get a right. seismometer onto the surface we, of Venus. Because if we knew that Venus did uh, have a liquid core and doesn't have a magnetic field, obviously it has nothing to do with the mass. With the mass, right. But if it turns out Venus does not have a liquid core, then maybe mass has yep. uh, something to play in terms of the assembly of the planet early in its history through planetesimal accumulation, accretion, right. all of this kind of stuff, and then the elements separating out, right, in right. this medium. Be because we hate thinking that Earth is just unique. Yes. Okay, we, we don't like operating as scientists from that point of view. So yes, there is a certain level of, we need tests on Venus, but Venus is really hard on equipment. I mean, its surface temperature is melting above the melting point of lead. It's like 800 Fahrenheit, around 457 Celsius, yeah. or some of that order. So it's, its atmospheric pressure is something like 15 times More Earth's. than that, I think. Okay. It's like 89 times Earth's yeah. pressure. And so it's really hot. It's really high pressure. And it's got sulfuric acid clouds. Right. It's really harsh environment on any type of electronics or mechanical equipment. Yeah, so that'd be, that'd be hard on a Ford. I know some people. <laughs> I know some people at one of the NASA locations up in Ohio that are actually working on finding circuits and other types of equipment that will survive in a. They even have a nice little chamber where they can simulate temperature and atmospheric composition of Venus. Right, so you're surviving in a hellish environment. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> well, I think we should wrap it up for today, Robert. All right. So I'd like to thank everybody who listened to this podcast, if not in real time, of course, after it's been recorded. And so uh, don't forget that if you're interested in science, if you like to further your education in the STEM field, uh, please consider joining the University of North Dakota. Joining Join the us. 
from Don't College of Arts and Sciences and the Department of Physics and Astrophysics. We're always here and welcoming new students. Absolutely. Yeah, and remember, learning never ends, mm. right? You until the day you die, right? So Absolutely. always be, you know, a long-term learner in your life. Now, the next podcast will happen next week on Tuesday, May the 9th at 3 p.m. Central Daylight Time. We always end with a quote, Robert. All right. Today. Well, who's our quote this time? Yeah, so we're going to quote Arthur C. Clarke. Do you remember Arthur C. Clarke? Absolutely. I've read his books, both physics and science fiction. Oh, look at that. So. And his major one, of course, is the 2001 Space Odyssey. Yep. Well known for that. And the quote from him today that we're going to uh, read is, I'm sure the universe is full of intelligent life. It's just been too intelligent to come here. <laughs> so thank you all for listening. Thank you. See you next time.